Hello, everybody. We've got a fairly small audience, so I will notice if you're not paying attention. <laughs> My name is Merle Kranz. This is Justin McLean. We're going to talk today about the Apache Software Incubator. So first off, a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, I am an individual contributor uh, for Apache Finract, or for also for the the Apache community, um, and I'm also the PMC chair of Apache Finract, which is a recently graduated project. We graduated in April of last year. I've had uh, nearly 20 years of software development experience, and uh, mostly in the areas around API development and REST uh, development. Um, and this is Justin. Justin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin. My voice is a little bit croaky, but I think it's going to last this talk. Uh, I, as mentioned up there, is I'm a, a bit of a released enthusiast. Um, I went through the incubator list the other day and counted out how many releases I had voted on, and the answer was 305. Um, I'll show talk a little bit about that later. Um, I'm also VP of uh, Apache Minute, which is a real-time operating system, and very recently um, the uh, VP chair of the incubator itself. Ah, okay. So, uh, everyone here is obviously aware of the Apache Software Foundation, yes? Good. Okay, so the Apache Software Foundation makes software open source software for the public good. They're, they're actually, um, their corporate structure is even set up that way so that they're a charity. Uh, um, and the Apache Incubator is just one of the many projects that is part of Apache. And it is where projects come to learn how to become an Apache project. Um, and more importantly, is how they can grow and build their communities. So in this presentation, we're going to cover the incubation process itself. Merle's um, going to talk about global po poverty mm -hmm. and, and how to solve that very hard problem. Uh, and also go through her experience uh, for with the going through the incubation project. And finally, we're going to talk about, you know, how do you succeed in becoming a, a successful project, open source project. Um, now, uh, we're not lawyers. Uh, we mention a few legal issues here. Um, if you need legal advice, please go ask a real lawyer. <laughs> um, uh, here be dragons. <laughs> so. so what is the Apache uh, incubator? It's basically the entry point where all Apache, uh, not all, but most Apache projects uh, come into. And uh, they spend some time in the incubator, usually between a year or two, learning about Apache and the Apache way, um, hopefully growing their com community and then becoming a, a top-level project. Um, so... Why would you want to bring your project to Apache in the, in the first place? You need to... Um, th there's certain things that your project has to follow in, uh, in order to do that and to become an Apache project. Um, being open and transparent is, is, is probably the most important one. Uh, everything that goes on in a project needs to be discussed in the open on the, on the mailing list. Um, also, Apache is very strong on individuals and not companies. Companies cannot buy uh, a seat on either the project management committee or on the board at Apache. Um, and everyone who acts at Apache is acting as an individual, not the company they work for. And you have to make that distinction very, very clear. And that takes some projects quite a long while to sort of get used to that. Uh, and so it can be quite tricky. Um, there's no vanilla ben dictators for life. There's no one, everyone is equal on the project. Um, some people may have slightly more responsibility. If you're a, a committer, you have a slightly more responsibility than the user, and if you're part of the PMC, uh, then you have slightly more responsibility again, but everyone's voice is, is basically equal, and everyone can discuss and comment on. Um, if a user votes on a release, 
that vote isn't actually binding, but you know, people will still listen to it, particularly if a, a lot of people say, ah, no, we've got something really wrong here, we need to, we need to fix this up. Um, so why do we actually go through an incubating process? Um, the first thing that you need to do is basically we want to give, Apache that is, want to give people uh, the basically... Uh, I've totally lost for words. <laughs> uh, they want to give people the security, I guess, that anyone can take some Apache software and use it and know there's no legal issues there. That's what I was trying to say. So that it all, all the licensing has been checked, all the IP of every single line of code is documented and knows where it comes from. So anyone can take that and use that under the terms of the Apache license and, and make their business out, out of it. Um, they also want to go through the incubating process to, as I said, learn the Apache way and also to learn about ASF policy. Um, and there's policies, uh, there's a huge number of policies. There's uh, uh, some legal policy, there's some branding policy, um, and there's some release policy, and that's basically it. All right. um, projects themselves are giving a, a, given a lot of freedom in how they operate and what they can do, uh, but as they do have these policies and guidelines that they ne need to, to, to follow in order to become an Apache project. So what is the Apache way? Well, it's, it's a sort of a hard thing to qualify. It's, um, it's a bit like Zen. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, once you know it, you know it, but if you don't know it, it's hard to explain to someone else. Uh, but there are some core things behind there uh, about it, and that includes collaboration, community, consensus, and being open. Uh, the... Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go any more into, into that. The Apache license itself um, allows anyone to take software that has the, the Apache license and use it for just about any purpose they want. There are no restrictions of use, um, and they can use it for commercial purposes if they want to. Uh, they can. Uh, we would like that they get involved in the project and you know, maybe contribute to it, either help out as users or raise some bugs or hopefully commit some code, but that's not a requirement. Um, and we, we find that a lot of people do give back and some don't, but that's, fi that's fine also. We, we end up with enough people that can help grow the project and, and the community around the project that way. The, it's obviously an open source license uh, and it's uh, one of the more permissive licenses. Uh, there's a few other licenses that are also permissive. MIT and BSD, for example, are the, very similar in, in, in those terms. Um, and, and as I was saying before, it means that there are no legal issues that you're going to have. If you have something that uh, comes from the ASF and it has an Apache license on it, you're pretty sure that no one is, will try and take you to court to say, you know, you're using our code or, or anything along those lines. So the incubator currently has uh, 50 projects in incubation. Um, it, they generally stay in incubation between one and two years. Uh, some, are, some are shorter, some are longer. Some never leave the incubator at all. I think we've got, I think the current record is five or six years. <laughs> um, and there's about, all these podlings make, well, as they're learning the process, they make releases. And there's been about uh, around 10 releases a month. Uh, come out of uh, out of the incubator there. So what do you have to go through to actually get into the incubator? Um, first off, you need to find someone who has done this before and can guide you through the process. Um, and they are your champion, and they will help you draft up a proposal, and which you'll then send to the incubator mailing list uh, for discussion. Um, just about every single proposal that gets to that stage, uh, will get accepted as an incubating project. There are, there is, uh, there's a few cases where that hasn't happened, and quite often there'll be a lot of discussion beforehand before it gets sent to the list, and th th they may just decide that, nah, no, the ASF is not a good fit for, for us because of whatever reason. Uh, so once uh, you've got your proposal, uh, you need at least three mentors, uh, and these are people who have experience uh, at Apache, 
um, and they're part of the incubator. And uh, they can their, their job is to help you through the incubation process from start to finish. Uh, and that's hopefully what you end up graduating and becoming a, a, a top level project from there. So then there's a discussion about the proposal and um, then it will generally be put for a vote and the incubator PMC will vote on it. Uh, and as I said, it's very, very rare that a, a project does not get accepted if it's got to that stage. Once it's been accepted, the podling then gets bootstrapped and that means uh, setting up servers, setting up mailing lists, setting up version control, setting up JIRA, you know, all that sort of infrastructure you need to be able to run the, pro run the project. Apache hosts all of that f for the project. There's no charge to the project in, in that regards. And uh, occasionally projects can ask for a few you know, different things. Not all projects are the, they're the same and sometimes requirements are, are, are a little different. Um, you need to check that uh, all of the initial committers that are on the project have signed a contributor agreement ICLA, uh, and that means that they say I'm legally allowed to give you this code, and it, there's no um, there's no IP issues with it, and that if it, it generally it's you know code you've written yourself, so you say you're giving up your IP rights to that code. Um, if the code, uh, if there's there's usually, usually projects that come to the incubator, uh, already have a community around them, and they'll have a large code base. Um, that, co that software needs to come in via a software grant. Um, and again, that's just the, the same sort of thing. It's, it's saying, like, here is this, all this code that we're do donating. Uh, the ASF now owns the IP of this code. So then the process is you need to look through all the code and double check that everything is, is all correct. And quite often it's not. Quite often there will be, you know, someone's copied some code from somewhere or, you know, uh, I know in one case I, I voted minus one on a, on a release because it had a picture of a cat in it, <laughs> so, which was actually done by a professional photographer and he owned the copyright to the, to the picture. So you have to go through and check that everything is, is correct as far as IP goes. And then you can start making releases. And hopefully once you start making releases and you get the word out there and you talk about your projects uh, at you know, conferences like this. Um, your community grows, you attract more people. Um, those, some of your users may become committers themselves and, and that, that sort of keeps going and going and going. So in order to grow your community though, you, you have to follow the principles behind the Apache way and that is making sure that you keep all the discussion on the mailing list that you are open and transparent about everything. And that um, you make sure that people are acting at the best interests of the project and not being you know, a puppet for, for, for a corporation. Um, and most of all, one of the things that we, it, it, it's not a hard requirement, but people, projects will stay in the incubator for a lot, lot longer if this doesn't happen, is that the people that make up the project need to be diverse. They need to come from different companies. Um, they need, the, 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 the one thing we're, we're really concerned about is that if all the committers are from a single company, that company changes direction, uh, and then you know, the project doesn't exist anymore. We want to try and stop that from happening. So then, you decide this is after, so say a year passes, you've made three or four releases, um, and you think you're ready to become a top level project. So, what you do then is you've decided that you're ready, you decide that you can self govern, you don't need any help anymore. Your mentors will still be around to help you uh, quite often after you graduate, and you know, sometimes there's questions that come up that, that haven't come up during graduation. And so, you can discuss becoming a top-level project on the mailing list, again, in the open, and then vote on it. Um, and uh, assuming that vote passes, um, that's it. You're a top-level project. So the voting on releases um, is a, a little different to some of the other voting uh, at Apache, and that is that um, the must be kept open for a minimum of 72 hours, so that allows everyone to participate, even people who 
uh, in different time zones, for example. And um, you need three plus one votes and more plus one votes than minus one votes. A minus one is not a veto. And the whole idea behind this is that as long as it's good enough and better than the previous release, that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. If a release is perfect, then you, if you're trying to make a release perfect, you'll never ever get there. There will always be some little problem with it that you know, that will end up doing that. So as long as the majority of people agree that it's a good release and it should be shipped, then ship it. Um, this is the stats on how I have voted on incubator releases. Uh, 270 times I've voted plus one on a release. 16 times I've voted plus zero because there were some issues there and I didn't feel what. And in 72 cases, uh, I've said, no, nah, sorry, there's a, there's a problem here and we've got to fix it. And three of my releases are in those 72, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so that's about 71%. Uh, of releases from me have gotten a plus one. And I think, I think that's sort of a, a good indicator of, uh, you know, and generally as a potling goes, you know, through its life cycle, it gets better and better and better at doing that. So most of those minus ones are the, you know, the first or the second releases that come out. Um, and as I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. And often you do make mistakes. If it's not your first time doing this, then it's quite likely you're not going to get it right. Um, for the first time ever, I saw a no, like the very first release candidate of uh, Podling's first release actually get voted plus one by everyone. I've only ever seen that happen once. <laughs> so um, it, you may also not be feel, you, you're not familiar with ASF policy at this point. You know you're still learning the ropes and you're still. You know, it, it's documented, but you know, some of the documentation needs improvement. Some of it is scattered all over the place. Um, so sometimes it's quite hard to work out what you should do. Uh, also, sometimes if you look at what other projects, top level projects are doing and try and copy them, sometimes they're not always doing the right thing either. either. So, you know, you've got to be a little careful about that. Hmm? Sorry. Oh. So, um, yeah, and it basically, it, it just you don't want to have any surprises in your release. So if you uh, if you know there's a problem in the release, document it. And if you document it, then you're more still more likely to get the the, the vote to pass. So now we're going to talk about uh, Finract at Apache, and I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what Finract does, what Finract is. So everybody who knows anything about global poverty is probably going to tell me this is a really hard problem in capital letters. This is a problem that we can't solve. There's no way we can solve it. You think about starving children in Somalia, and then you're like, that's terrible. I feel bad about that, but I can't do anything about it. But if we look at this, you can see that starting in the 1820s, global poverty began to dramatically decline. Um, global poverty, in this case, being, de being defined as the number of people making the yellow line, the number of people making less than $2 a day, adjusted for inflation. The, black, uh, the red line then is the number of people making less than $1 a day, again, adjusted for inflation. And the black line on the right is $1.90 a day. So you see that through the Industrial Revolution, around that time, the number, the percentage of the worldwide population living in global poverty has gone dramatically down. And at this point, we're, we're headed towards um, dipping under 10% of the worldwide population, despite the fact that the worldwide population has been growing. Um, under 10% of the worldwide population is in living in poverty. Yes, it's still far too high but we're making progress against it, so it must be a solvable problem. What if we want to solve the problem? What do we need to do? Well, a naive person might say, we just give everybody enough money to have more than $2 a day, right? Well, let's look at that naive solution. What would that mean? This is how much money it would cost if we were to give everybody in the world who makes less than $2 a day enough money to be over that $2 a day mark. And it's done uh, progressively. You see the amount of money, the absolute amount of money that would be required to do that has gone down. So we started in the 1980s at around fi over 500 million. We're actually below 150 million now. So 
clearly we are making progress, but what do we need to finish that? What do we need to get that last step over, over this, uh, to, to get those last 10 percent? Well, we know why we're making the progress we're making. It's because of the Industrial Revolution. So we need something that changes the playing field in the same way that the Industrial Revolution changed the playing field in this sort of exponential way. And one possibility is microfinance. So there are two billion people on this planet who don't have bank accounts. Anybody here ever taken out a loan? Anybody here uh, saving for like a vacation or for retirement? Yeah. These are things that are core to our, our financial well-being. Um, I personally took out loans in order to pay for my college education, and I wouldn't be making, uh, I, I wouldn't be as financially well off today as I am without that. If you don't have a bank account, there are lots of things you just can't do that would make it possible for you to raise yourself out of poverty. So in 1976, Muhammad Yunus um, was living in a village in Bangladesh, and he noticed that there were women who were building bamboo furniture, who didn't have a lot of money, uh, who were trying to, uh, they, they were buying bamboo, and in order to buy the bamboo, they couldn't go to a bank to borrow the money. The banks wouldn't give them the money, they were too poor. They had to go to sh loan sharks, and the loan sharks were lending them this money at exorbitant interest rates. So what he did was he just, he lent these women, there are 42 women, he lent them $27, all of them together, $27. They bought the bamboo, they made the furniture, they paid back the loan with a tiny bit of interest, and everybody was wealthier, and microfinance was born. So he took this model, and he expanded on it, and he founded a bank called the Grameen Bank, in which he loaned tiny amounts of money to poor people that they could then use to build businesses and to lift themselves out of poverty. And this was microfinance, and it continued. Um, by 1983, the project was turned into a full-fledged bank. By 1997, the Grameen Foundation worldwide was founded. It works because poor people are just like rich people. They want to be able to contribute back to their societies. They want to build things. They've even done some studies on this. Microfinance actually is effective in lifting people out of poverty. So 55% of Grammy customers who remain customers for five years or more exit poverty. And the average credit write-off is 1%. The average overdue rate is between 3 and 6%. So what does this have to do with software? So before I, before I go into what this has to do with software, um, this model uh, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. The, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee recognized that this was very impactful in, in moving the world forward. And one, uh, one thing about this that was a little bit different, one reason why you were able to lend money to these, to these poor people is something called solidarity lending. So people would get together in groups, Mostly women, this was mostly targeted at women, they would get together in groups and they would say, lend one of our members the money, or lend all of us together the money. But um, as a group, they would be able to say, if she doesn't pay it back, then we will come together and make up the difference. This, uh, this reduces the risk for the bank because there's more people stepping up. But it also has a couple of other knock-on knock -on effects. So there's the additional um, social pressure, positive and negative, on the person who receives the money. And there is, they have regular meetings so that people can exchange financial know-how. They can learn from each other about how to run businesses successfully. This is a form of community, or this is an aspect of community that's being leveraged here to lift people out of poverty. And it's the community aspect that I find so interesting about this. So, again, what does software have to do with this? Well, accounting is the oldest software application. There was, there was accounting being done on computers of various sorts before computers were really properly invented in their modern form. Doing uh, interest calculations requires a lot of 
mundane work that requires a great deal of, of care for a human being that computers do very easily. And big banks use closed source systems because that was the first kind of system there was out there. They, they use these very expensive systems. They cost uh, millions of dollars. Depending on the system, they can, they can go as low as a quarter of a million dollars a year, um, or they can be massively expensive. And if you've got a small MFI who's serving a village with 30 people, each of which has a deposit of maybe $2, you can't afford these systems. You can't amortize it across a large number of relatively wealthy customers. But we've seen this kind of problem in open source before, right? How do we spread out the costs of solving a problem across a large group? Well, in 2004, the Grameen Foundation began to develop an open source solution to banking. And this solution was spun off, and it was, became the MIFOS initiative, the MIFOS software. And this software was donated to the Apache Software Foundation in December of 2015. In December of 2015, Finract was born, came to the Apache Software Foundation into the incubator. We were then in the incubator until April of 2017. So we were in the incubator for 15 months while we learned about the Apache way, about the Apache release process, while we scrubbed our IP. And now we're looking at supporting the next generation of financial inclusion project, products. So now uh, the uh, cell phone mobile coverage has increased, which makes it possible to reach more customers in rural areas. Um, at the same time, we have exciting new technologies like blockchain that we need to work out how to or uh, to what extent to offer to uh, people in need of financial inclusion products. A report from the McKinsey Global Institute found that delivering financial services by my mobile phone could add $3.7 trillion to the GDP of developing co countries by 2025. That's enough money to create 95 million jobs, and that is enough money to to lift those, the, that last 10% out of poverty if it's distributed appropriately. So what was our process like? Well, the first thing we did was we found a champion, as Justin mentioned earlier. Our ch champion was um, Ross Gardler. The next thing we did was we drafted, uh, well, we picked a project name. We couldn't keep the old project name because the MIFOS initiative still existed as an independent entity. I don't know if was anybody here in was anybody here in in uh, Shane's talk. You can't fork a brand, right? The Mifos brand already exists, so we had to pick a new name um, to exist under at the Apache Software Foundation. Then we had to analyze the code, and this was actually the hardest part: was to find any dependencies in our code that would inhibit somebody from using that code uh, in their own projects. Looking, basically looking for GPL or LGPL dependencies. And then we write a proposal and send it to the Apache incubator list. And then we go into the process that Justin has already described. You go through discussion. People ask questions. We answer the questions. We say where we see the problems. Then uh, there's a vote. And we were voted in in December of 2015. Justin mentioned earlier that 70% of release candidates are accepted by the incubator. Some are not. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. If you've already made a successful release, that, that sort of uh, evens it out. But we had a bit of trouble at the beginning. We tried, we, gave, we made three releases. Um, they were all rejected. Thank you. And I mean that seriously. <laughs> We made three release attempts. Can, um, can you remember what some of the issues were? They were all um, GPL dependencies. Um, Hibernate, Open G, uh, Hibernate was, we replaced with OpenGPA um, to, to resolve those issues. So uh, on our fourth try, we made it. And we made another couple of releases. And once we had shown that we could make releases and grow the community, then we were able to graduate. So what does grow the community actually mean? Well, we have to propose contributors. How do we propose contributors? Well, we have a private mailing list, and we do it on private so that if there, somebody's rejected, we don't hurt any feelings. Um, we have a private mailing list, and the, the project management committee that the project started with 
proposes people who have been making contributions as committers. We say, how about him? How about her? She's done this, that, and the other thing. Um, we're very happy with this, and maybe we should give her uh, access to the d direct access to the repo or uh, also the recognition that's involved with being a committer. So you make, you make a proposal. So it's the same as bringing the, the project into the incubator. You make a proposal. People ask questions. You answer them. Maybe there's some, some controversy. For the most part, in most cases, at least in our project, uh, the co committers were then voted in. After we'd done this for uh, roughly a year, we went and said, we think we're ready. The incubator's great, but we're not learning much here anymore. It's time for us to move on, and it's time for us to free those resources, resources so that other, those, those mentors, so that other projects can come into the incubator under their, their guiding hand. So we sat down together and we said, here are a list of things that we felt like we should be able to do before we leave the incubator. Can we do them? Yes, no. What do we need to do? A couple of things we wanted to change, and we did, and then we Put, put together a proposal, sent it to the incubator, and the incubator approved it and sent it onto the board. Once it reaches the board, the board then says, uh, basically the board, I don't know of any instance where the board hasn't followed the recommendation of the incubator. Not once. Not once. Um, the, the incubator makes the recommendation to the board, but the board is the governing body of the Apache Software Foundation, and the board is the body that makes the resolution, this is now a top-level project at Apache. So this for me actually has, this, this process of building communities has a lot in common with what our customers, what Finneract customers are doing. They are building communities or taking existing communities and learning new things in those existing communities in order to help support each other and to help support the rest of the world um, to, to, yeah, to, to make all of our lives a little better. Community is what makes this work. The, the willingness to reach out to another person and help them and uh, to, to want to be able to do something for other people. So how do you make the world a better place? Well, contribute to a community. And at this point, are there any questions? Um, well, thanks for the presentation. Um, just out of curiosity, I was uh, interested to know who was backing the, the contributors for this community. So what companies were employing them? And is it always good, the relationship with those companies, or do you ever get like political pressure to get committers or users promoted to committers? And so um, there are several companies you haven't heard of uh, backing this, starting with the Mifos Initiative, which is a nonprofit. They did at that point uh, pay contributors. I was, was working for the Mifos Initiative when we entered incubation. Um, there's also a couple of companies that do service software as a service for MFIs, microfinance institutes. Um, they, uh, so there's Musoni from the Netherlands and there's Conflicts from India. Um, they also both have contributors and we also have a lot of individual contributors. So we actually, we rely probably more than any other Apache project on contributions from Google Summer of Code, um, which requires a fair bit of organization and yeah. Well, at uh, Apache as a whole, uh, only about half uh, the contributors are actually fully em uh, employed by a, a company. The other half are volunteers and do it in their spare time. Yeah, and that's, we like people doing it in their spare time because they tend to be very passionate. Um, we also like people doing it for companies because they tend to be very consistent. Um, these, are, these are two good things that you can combine together. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any more questions? You mentioned that it's not so big problem if the release is not excellent, but what about if some older releases still contain some problematic license li pr code with problematic license? Is it a problem or? Did you want to take this one? Um, well, it. <sighs> 
it's easily fixed. You, you make another release. So, but the uh, older is will be available from the Apache side, right? So uh, the new uh, release will be fixed, but what about the older release? Isn't it a problem? Well, it, it depends what, you, what sort of issue that you're talking about. You know, if, if something is broken and it doesn't work, you're not going to release no, it. No, some GPL problem for you. Um, um, if there's... Uh, if a release produces some sort of legal jeopardy for the customers, yeah. then it won't get released. Yeah. Um, that's uh, yeah. The the like most of those uh, most of those minus one votes were there were because they had compiled code in a source release. Um, the second most thing I vote minus one on is is because of incompatible licenses, and that's usually fairly easy to check. It it it's not often hidden. So okay, okay, thanks. One more question. Ah. Has it um, ever happened that somebody, some contributor, out of not knowing it, signed off these intellectual, like this, this rights uh, off, mm -hmm. and uh, but but ever like did an error in this, and and you ended up having problems with, uh, yeah, com contaminations in in terms of having code. Uh, that, that I, I can. Like, I mean, like uh, because it, at some point contributors, they sort of. Um, Say that that they have the right to give mm -hmm. give those 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 things away, but I mean, as a human, and if you've written a lot of code, and you might not know where, you know, if your practices aren't really completely clean, then you might have gotten something from somewhere. Uh, I, Does I it can, ever happened? Or I can think of a couple of cases where that has happened, um, and it's generally been found out and fixed, so that the offending code has been removed. That doesn't mean that with you know every single case that has occurred. It's ge it's generally fairly obvious because. The code is not in the same style as the rest, or there may be some odd comments or something in there. Like there's just so a few little things that you can see that will trigger you to think, "Hey, well, I wonder where that is from." And these days, you can just do a search on the internet and find if the code was from somewhere else, and uh, you go, "Ah, oh, yeah, okay, that's where it came from." And, and this is where the four eyes principle or the twenty eyes principle becomes yeah. very important. Is uh, that's the only way to find things like that. If you do find something like that, then the only thing you can do is remove the code and either just remove it or replace it. Hmm. Well, it it depends what the license of the code is. Okay. Yeah. So it could actually become from somewhere else that had a compatible license, and in that four, you've just got to recognise that and say, "Yep, this code came from here," and and that's all good. So if you're curious about licensing issues, we have a workshop uh, right after this that so we'll be going in more detail through licensing and releases. So any more questions? Yeah, I think we are um, on time by now. So okay. um, thank you very much, Merle and Justin. <laughs>